Hey, uh, it's Anfa and Luigi Verona. Today we hey. have a little voice chat because uh, we had a little Facebook discussion about open source software and commercial software for music production. That started when I wrote uh, that I'm <laughs> not happy about Windows 10 having advertisement inside uh, when it's paid product and you play and, and, and you have to watch ads. So I was angry about this. And then... Uh, Luigi, you pointed out like 15 different things that are very, like, there's no open source tools to do in music production, like beat slicing uh, and stuff. I yeah, yeah to... I, can, I can also set a stage a little bit because, uh, like, just so that it doesn't seem that I'm a fan of ads and operating systems or anywhere else, uh, I mean, I that advertising like won't go away and it's uh something that humans do and will have to do like if you produce something you will have to show advertising of some sort somewhere and i totally understand you know like i'm not a windows fan uh and just in terms of my tastes i actually do like linux for my everyday life uh, i use a windows laptop at work for example and i'm not very happy with that system for various reasons i actually don't see much ads there but i have seen it and it was surprising to me uh that hey now operating systems have ads uh, but I haven't really studied this. Like, maybe they are turned off easily. I don't know. So I have no idea there. I have no opinion on that. I think that at some point in time, what happened, because, like, we were really discussing Linux audio versus proprietary, I would say, audio, or even maybe Windows, not all of it proprietary. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess I guess that we were talking about making money and, uh, you know, something like that. So I actually, that's, I don't that's remember a, that's how... That's an important started. puzzle that I didn't get from reading just... Like, I think that that changed my perception of what you wrote there. And maybe we should post a link, I don't know, to Facebook if someone wants to read up that discussion. Because it's yeah, too yeah, long sure. to just, you know, read it in the video. Also, I also think that Facebook is inherently bad at, at yeah. uh, you know, at discussions because uh, all of those branches of comments are not easy to parse later on. And uh, then at some point in time, if the discussion is very lengthy, then... The Facebook will just, you'll just have to always click more and more and more, and uh, it's just not easy to follow. Uh, so, yeah, so that's why we decided to kind of make a follow up. Okay, so, yeah, let me, I mean, I think if you, um, because like, the, the main point that, that I got from you was that uh, when you try to make serious music production with open source tools, you're going to hit a wall many times when you just, don't have a tool that you need or you have to use many different tools and do workarounds to get them to work together or to get them to work at all often because sometimes you know there is a obscure little tool that someone made but you need to compile it to get it working like there's a plugin to uh, for noise cancellation in real time and it's called noise repellent but you need to build it from source it it doesn't have any dependencies, so it's easy. But still, you have to download the source and type some comments. You know, not not everyone can do this. So I, so I, I got this point, and yeah. <laughs> but on the other hand, like without having this um, idea that you're doing this because you want to get serious in music production, like you don't want to make stock music to sell it, and you need just things that will get you through to have a, a decent product that you can sell. That's something I missed, and and that that got me like a little feeling that you kind of detest the open source community as a whole because it lacks so much in the in the regard of features. Right. So so let me let me clarify my position. First of all, um, uh, so I found the comment that started the discussion. It was actually not your post specifically. It was a comment by Lee Strickland. Who said oh, yeah. Windows should only be used specifically for games that can be ran under Wine yet? Everything else, such as work, web browsing, and viewing porn, LOL, should be done under Linux or Unix as they're not prone to the security issues of Windows and have better software available to them for those types of activities nine times out of ten. So, actually, I was replying to that claim that basically, apart from games, Linux could do everything uh, nine times out of ten. And then I kind of said, unless you need to do serious graphics or video editing or electronic music with modern synth or, or, or. That was my comment. 
And then somebody else also agreed with me. And that's where we started to discuss because you said, well, I actually do this, uh, you know, and that and that. And you kind of, um, yeah. you know, gave some options on graphics. Uh, and then we talked about, uh, about, you know, about actually talking about music. So just to clarify my position on the open source uh, community as a whole, uh, I've written up a uh, an article that I consider to be probably currently my best estimation of what I feel and think about Linux Audio, uh, which is called Linux Audio and Overview, and you can get it at lugirona.com, uh, where, where I talk about the current state of Linux Audio. Now, my personal opinion is that Linux Audio and open source community are really, really great. I, I love that. Uh, I, I consider myself to be a part of the open source community because I do release some software and most of the time it's open source when it makes sense. Like if I'm releasing some obscure game, I'm not going to bother preparing the sources and you know releasing when I know nobody's going to really need it. Or when I'm releasing some funny project on the web. So Unless probably someone general, comes and says, hey, can you release the source code for this? I want to hack it up. Yeah, I mean, if somebody says that, I usually have no problem giving up the source code. Uh, I don't think that any of the projects I've made so far, you know, I, I have no problem giving it away. Uh, but I really doubt that somebody will ask for that. Uh, but in the end, uh, I guess that the important, the important point is that liking open source and thinking that open source can do everything are two different things. So uh, frequently what happens is that people hold these binary positions where they say, well, Linux can do everything, therefore Linux sucks. Or Windows has ads, therefore everything Windows sucks. Or uh, I, I don't like that particular software being proprietary because I would love to hack it up, therefore everything proprietary sucks, and so on, so on, so on. Uh, I don't hold such a binary view. I have a very nuanced view on free software philosophy, actually, and the open source community in general. I just think that you have to understand what it can objectively do and what it cannot objectively do. And it is clear to me that all claims that open source community has the same level of professionalism and, and availability and uh, reliability as the commercial software world or proprietary software world, to me, this claim just, you know, it just, it doesn't stand. I just don't buy it. And I, I think that frequently that is construed as, oh, you're against open source. But all I'm saying is that, no, open source is just a very different beast. And I think that a lot of people who are in the open source community, they don't even set a goal of creating necessarily something that will match a commercial offering. Quite a lot of people who are in the open source community don't even care about whether software proprietary or not, per se. You know, like there are people who religiously hold to that view. But I have talked to huge amounts of people who are like, yeah, you know, I like the idea of open source. You can share, you can learn, you know, these kind of things. Uh, and, you know, I want to write this specific thing that I want to write. I mean, people can use, you know, they can buy Adobe After Effects and do that, but I want to write this small utility for myself. Maybe someone finds it interesting. Like, they're not even trying to replace any of it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so that's the claim kind of I was responding to. And the fact that Linux Audio does not give you all the possibilities that, for example, you will find on the Windows operating system, uh, it doesn't mean that open source is bad. It means it has its own place and purpose for people. Yeah, I think Internet uh, is very is very bad for discussing views because usually they get flattened out and we miss the whole wide spectrum of it and we just see one piece and that happened to me like i try to keep a wide view but i i filtered out something from your uh from your post and i got a view on your view that was false and now i see that it's not true what i thought and I think that's true. That yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think I think that you can view uh, the internet kind of in two ways. On one hand, if you're yeah, if you're reading something, then you can you can have a different opinion. On the other hand, because it's written up, you can actually go back, reread, and say, wait a minute, maybe you know, and you can also correct that. It's it's just really a difference between oral and written debates, and I think that both. The, both kind of debates require a lot of experience. People typically are very bad at debating anyone uh, on any topic, 
this is really something this is a skill that you have to develop yeah. when you're talking like person to person and if both people are kind of constructive and hey let's discuss this then perhaps it is easier to quickly and formally address some situations like oh, oh no 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 that's not what i meant he, he here's what i meant and you got it well yeah. when you're writing it up unless you're really writing it like it's a huge article with here's my assumptions here's what i think here are the conclusions you will not you know you will not generally get there because you will write a phrase you haven't stated your assumptions or what you mean there and unless it's really written up well people will read it the way like according to their context uh, i'm right now in the process of hopefully completing after a year of work uh, an article on uh the, the gnu philosophy of richard stallman uh which i find many issues with uh and again my position is super nuanced i'm not saying that free software is bad or that mr stallman is completely wrong although i believe that he is mostly wrong and that and i try to uh present my arguments in, in favor of that but the reason i bring it up is because uh, that article required requires like me to really state a lot of things restate them many times so that it is a clear, well laid out argument. Uh, actually, I think that in my Linux audio overview, I have the same. Uh, and if you want, we can go uh, over some of the main arguments that we uh, discussed uh, on Facebook so that, you know, viewers of this video can, you know, uh, make up their own mind and understand what kind of discussion we had. Yeah, that might be a good thing. Uh, I'm going to open it up to have it on my, on my view. Actually, I before we even decided to make a video i just typically save these things so i actually have it saved in an uh in a text file because i when i when i'm writing something to facebook i typically first write it in a text file because in facebook it's not very easy to do and then oh, i yeah. copy it over you can extend you can accidentally press enter instead of shift yeah. enter to insert a new line and you post it and i did that a few times yeah. and i removed my post because it wasn't complete and that was yeah that's the thing. With so, so oh, do you want do you want me to kind of make my general claim first, or do you yeah. want to you want me to start? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Lead it. So, so basically, my contention is that Linux audio is a great thing for experimentation, and uh, I'm going back to Paul Davies like Davis lecture at uh, LAC 2017. I think that he he really nailed it when he said that it's a great ground for experimentation. It's a great uh, playground but um when it comes to actual production value like hey is this is this a platform that will allow me to produce music and uh, by music here of course number one i mean electronic music uh because i'm not recording instruments and i'm just not familiar with how easy it is uh, to do that on linux maybe it is so i don't know but if we're talking about specifically electronic music and number two complex electronic music and i understand that this is a very um, difficult to define term but what i mean here is when you're really working on a detailed arrangement that means you have to go back to certain places in the arrangement fix things re-record things uh something that you would actually do in a lot of modern DAWs. uh this is the kind of music i'm looking at and when i'm looking at that kind of music i see a couple of major problems with linux uh number one is that the amount of plugins is, uh, or let's say high quality plugins on Linux is very low, both for effects and synthesizers. Uh, and these effects and synth synthesizers are super basic typically, where uh, like if you go to Windows or Mac OS, uh, creating an effect or synthesizer plugin is a creative process. People come out with beautiful, beautifully designed, and I mean, not only visually, but I mean, in terms of DSP, uh, digital sound processing, beautifully designed products that are unique because they're creating interesting sound, they're combining filters, they're, they're giving you an interesting sequencer and stuff like that, like very complicated, interesting instruments. That inspire uh, so you to create something that you wouldn't create with a different tool because the way that the tool presents possibilities to you influences your workflow. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's like, so it's like if you, if you buy, you can buy different synthesizers and they will have different capabilities. And you, for example, if you buy, I'll give a very simple example. If you buy a TB303, uh, you know, you'll be able to get a very particular sound that is unattainable on other synthesizers uh, most of the time. 
so that's one, right? So the, the unavailability of the DSP part of electronic music. Uh, and number two is that uh, the modular environment, uh, apart from LMMS, which we can t discuss uh, separately, if you're talking about a modular environment, this is extremely difficult to create a different difficult arrangement uh, or a complicated arrangement on Linux because you have to go back, you have to edit things, and if you just record it, you, you set up things in a modular environment, you connect it up, you record it s something, then you maybe you can even try to save it or write a bash script for it if you want, and you remove that, then you open it up again, and then you realize you made a mistake. Now you have to re-record everything, and you have to go back and reconnect things. It's just not easy to do. This can I, can I insert something? Sure, we, I can stop here. Um, I, I experimented when I in my first like years of discovering Linux and open source music software. I like take took a look at all this, all these standalone tools like Sec twenty four, and and various synthesizers like PhaseX that isn't available as a plugin yet. I asked the devs to do that, but no idea if it's coming out ever any time soon, and like it's. Even with there are like a few standards of session management when you can connect programs between, but I never really understood how they work, and you never really know what is supported and what isn't, and it's like I don't know. I feel like walking up a ten-level building on a wooden ladder and you know just waiting to fall on my face. So I keep everything inside a DAW, and and for years it was LMMS, but as I'm doing more recording of my voice uh, and guitars, maybe some other things and like recording a sample and then time stretching it. In LMS, you can't really do this. So for previous albums, I, I did my music in LMS, my sequencers arrangement and stuff, and I exported a mix and I overdubbed vocals and other instruments in Ardor, but that's a little bit complicated and you can't really sketch things. So I'm shifting to, towards Ardor, but yeah. Uh, I did a modular thing for, for live gigs with a band uh, where I had uh, a plugin host, Carla, running and a, a piano, a gig sampler, I don't know, fluid synth for, for a piano sound from a big sound font. Uh, and, I, and I used a bash script to, to, to set this up, so I just run the machine, boot it up and it was ready to play. Uh, but it had its issues, it, it crashed a few times uh, during the gigs. So, yeah, it's it's not very rock solid. I yeah, carry on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I I, I guess that uh, the um, kind of the important maybe point here is a more fundamental one. You, like you look at all of the situation and you ask yourself, well, why is that happening? Or and, and like you can do two things. You can just describe what is going on in the on the Linux platform in terms of audio. And then you can supply an explanation why that's happening. And if I look at what is going on in Linux, and I think you have responded to me that, hey, like maybe you can, if you, if you, so my, my, I, I can actually uh, read a couple of things that I said because we then went on in a more into more detail. Uh, but one of the things that we said was this. I said is that that da -da 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 -da, one moment I'm searching for this exact exact okay. A lot of the plugins that do exist typically have only very basic controls, I say, and are not on par with proprietary counterparts. Simplest example, more or less the only usable delay from the calf pack doesn't have panning controls. It allows you to switch between panning modes. Actually, I actually asked the developer to do that. Uh, he added some panning modes for me. Uh, but does not allow to specify panning on the input or output signal, something that I see available by default in many delay pins, including built-in plugins in NFL, NFL Studio, which is uh, currently my... Uh, DAW of choice, uh, which I run through Wine, which thankfully it runs pretty well. Oh, so you're running um, FL Studio on Linux through Wine? Yes, yes. Uh, that's that's why lately I've been so productive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, the the point here, and you were saying, well, you can actually ask developers to add some things, and, and I, I agree, you can. I actually, as I just said, I asked the Calf developer. Um, to add the, the panning control, not the controls, but the modes. It's like from R, L to R, from R to L, that's actually, I asked for that. Um, and uh, the problem is that, yes, you can theoretically ask, but that's, I'm talking about a fundamental 
difference in quality, I guess. If you're looking at plugins that exist typically in Linux, they're all covering the basics. Here's a basic delay. Here's a basic distortion. Here's a basic this, basic that. But that's not the approach that the rest of the world has taken in the past, I don't know, 15, if not 20 years. Uh, well, okay, 15, yeah, I guess. If you even look at, at, at what people do with synth edit, uh, the plugins are much more interesting. Yes, of course, it's, it's necessary to have basic plugins, and typically a DAW will provide things by default, like a reverb, a delay, your basic compression, whatever, everything, like this, this whole list. But it seems that Linux Audio keeps on building the basic stuff. Again and again. And it, <laughs> yeah, yeah, again and again. I mean, I, I kind of understand it. The reason for this, I guess, if we, you know, now shift to explanation. You have five basic that, delays. Everyone does something differently, but none gets too deep. Not yesterday, because a lot of people, I guess, are learning. They're kind of, okay, you know, I'm starting my DSP class. Oh, here's Linux. Wow, here's an available library. I don't have even to write anything. I just can take the library, start writing up my code. Okay, I have this basic delay plugin. I present it on my class, at my class, and then I, then I just release it for whatever reason. Let's or throw it up on GitHub cool. and see what happens. Yeah, yeah. Whereas, whereas on the Windows environment, first of all, people are typically doing these things so that actual musicians will want to actually use it in their production to get results, not just to learn how to code, but to get results. And number two, there is basic stuff already. And so they're building on top of that. Hey, here's, here's an interesting delay. Instead of just saying, hey, here's yet another delay plugin, which I know I'm not going to sell, or even if you're doing it for free, there, there's actually a lot of very high quality free plugins on Windows. Uh, but you're saying, there is delay. So let me create this delay bank where I have one delay, second delay, third delay, fourth and fifth, and then the person can turn all of them on, change the parameters, and instead of just ping, 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 it will be like ping, 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 you know. And, and then you can create these complicated tribal rhythms that are typically used in something like minimal housing techno, stuff like that. And you have really sophisticated stuff. And that means somebody had, set, you know, that person sat down, he actually, this created an idea, productized it, then developed this thing, and now it's a very usable and interesting tool that gives you something new, that, that allows you to build on on something uh, on the basics and then add some interesting twist to your music. Now, of course, one can say, well, you can kind of, you know, take several delays and try to do that. Sure, you can do anything. You can, instead of using an elevator, you can just run up the stairs, but that's the point of the elevator. It up. To make it and I think that in the 90s, uh, people spent a lot of time before uh, a lot of the musicians were using computers. If uh, I, I think I typically mentioned the interview done by, um, uh, damn, uh, I have to, okay, the name is loading, by this very famous artist who was uh, explaining how he had to connect all the modules and then synchronize them and then only do the music. And that meant that he had to plan everything in advance. Uh, and... Uh, and right now on Linux, a lot of time by musicians is spent uh, on setting things up. And when you're setting things Fixing up, problems. Uh, yeah, and something and, doesn't I mean, work. Spending a lot of time on it when it and, worked yesterday. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's so, true. and that, that's kind of that's that's one of the problems of this argument is that yeah, you can probably take all of these tools and create something along the lines of what they're giving, but also it's not always possible. But like there are plugins which will, there's no way you can take you know separate modules and create something like that if i um it's um, i still haven't found a good way to say it uh in our discussion i kind of said that well a lot of these things are quite, quite creative products they're like little works of art if you take something like this very old orange vocoder well uh do you know this plugin no never used it no yeah so orange vocoder has a very interesting so a lot of these plugins, let me see if I can formulate what I, what I mean by this. You can, if you look at a complicated plugin, it still uses, it, it consists out of basic elements, right? So uh, Orange Vocoder uh, uh, is, was very popular plugin that was used in a lot of music uh, where they have this, they, they have a vocoder, they have a built-in carrier synthesizer and carrier samples very beautiful samples actually the synthesizer is rarely used i guess people typically use samples that are provided with them and then it has filters for all the carriers so you can filter it down filter it up it has distortion 
And so you can change the sound and the way it works. And then it has this interesting graph, uh, which will also change the frequency of carrier. And you can drag the points and it will kind of shade the sound. And then it has the volume, of course, something that I guess most recorders have. Uh, how loud is the carrier? How loud is the sword? You know, all these things. So you have all of these things. And but it's it's packed into one package in such a way that it kind of makes sense. Yeah, and also they have that's a very important thing. They have a keyboard down there, and you can actually uh, uh, check the notes, uh, highlight them, and that's uh, the carrier wave will play these notes. Then. And so, um, and yeah, so granted, all of these all of these elements are separately very simple. But putting them together into this one package and creating this product, this orange vocoder, that's kind of, in a way, creativity. You know, somebody had to, to sit down and do that and envision that this will be an interesting sound and put this thing, these things together. And so it's not, I, I guess that a lot of the times I feel uh, that whenever on, you know, we're discussing Linux audio, it becomes very technical. It's like as if there's no creativity, but there's just this raw DSP and... Uh, Whereas a lot of it is just good creative work. You just have to put these things together creatively to get a very interesting product that nobody else did before. So and, it's a little bit uh, like that, someone has to design a workflow for a tool and someone else yeah. has to implement I mean, that I, workflow. I think, I think somebody just has design, to design a tool, just a more complex tool. Yeah. Maybe and, uh, I if I can interrupt Linux you a little. It doesn't have that mentality. People, <clears throat> people focus on kind of basic stuff on, on on the DSP itself because a lot of people are developers who are interested in the DSP, but not a lot of people are actually interested to make music, actually, on Linux. I don't see that much of it. People are interested in developing things, not making music. Hmm. I think that's an interesting point, and this is something I, uh, I thought and felt myself like it's a little bit like Linux audio is all about the developers and all about people making some tools but you rarely see you rarely see these tools put into good use and i think that sonoy convention is something that is there to counter this like to 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 restore the balance when the tools are for musicians and the musicians creating music with it and saying hey, this works great, but we would love to have something else here, or we need a tool that does this. I think that, yeah, it's hard to get serious artists to use open source software, and that's true. And I... But not, not even, I would say, uh, so there, there are quite a number of tools. Uh, uh, not, I'm not sure whether they have like open source status, of course. Uh, like for most people, Again, like if we're talking about musicians, they don't care whether it's open source or not, right? They may care if this is free or not. This is another kind of trap, developer-centric trap. Hey, but this is not open source. You know, like you don't have all the freedoms. As a non-developer, I don't care. I'm not, I don't care about the sources. This is not entirely true. There are implications of something being open source. There are implications that are relevant to the end user, even who's not a, who's not a developer. But in general, in like everyday uh, discussions typically your your serious musician will not care whether it's open source or not he will care whether it's usable or not how much it costs and uh, of course a lot of proprietary stuff uh, just costs a lot like music plugins they cost huge amounts of money uh, yeah I tend to think that there is a good reason behind that and that a lot of limited resources are required to create a, a given plugin but uh, that aside I would say that the dip, why I would generally say that open source part of Linux audio is not going to change much um, is because in the end, although this is not a rule, typically most developers will not necessarily care about the users that much. Uh, there are exceptions. There are developers who really ask what the users want and try to implement everything and make sure that the tool is usable and is being used. But as a general rule, uh, I would say that free software developers even tend to moderately oppose the increase of their user base because to them it just means more tickets and more bugs and more 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 complaining about their program. Yeah. Uh, where more they're just having fun, right? They're not selling it. They don't care if they're like a million users. Sure, it's kind of it's good for the ego, I guess, a little bit. But 
there's a limit to that. And I've seen many times where a prominent Linux audio developer will just is not that interested. He's like, yeah, I'm glad you enjoy the software. Please don't send me any emails, bugs, or features. I'm not going to do anything. That's the default response because he knows that if somebody is happy and he responds to them, they're going to ask them to do something about it. And they're, they don't want to do that. Uh, where I think Linux Audio will become better is thanks to the cross-platform products that are done by commercial companies like Bitwig. Right now, Bitwig is a real game changer for Linux. If somebody wants to move to Linux for whatever reason, I, and this reason is not bound to never using proprietary software or something ideological like that, then now a person who's like, well, I want to do music, now they can do it. Now they can say, well, there is Bitwig. Yeah, you know, you have to invest and actually buy it, of course, and it's, it's not cheap at all. But at least now you have the option, whereas before you had to stick with, for example, LMMS which is not bad, but its its development is now more or less put on pause because there are many of the developers who are senior and very good at DSP and development, they left. And uh, the community struggles to find somebody who can lead the development, but it's difficult. And so LMMS is a great example. I, it's a big surprise. It's a very well-made tool, and it shows that you, know, you can actually put together even using uh, if, if somebody, if, if a good developer, skilled developer starts a program, he can actually develop, you know, something along the lines of, in this case, FL Studio. Uh, but nobody, I mean, questioned that, right? But that's the nature of open source. There is no commitment. Uh, a lot of people, when they look at a proprietary product, one of the things that they notice, hey, there's a software vendor behind the product. Therefore, we're now dependent on that guy. Uh, and wouldn't it be great, the free software philosophy states, if nobody would own that product? Or if there would be like a team that is that, that like there's an open source product, which means that really nobody owns it or everybody owns it. But in the end, it means that the developer of that product doesn't have much commitment. You know, you're not paying him. You're not motivated. That's not a, that might not, there might not be enough motivation. Something happens. The person gets married, has kids, whatever. Done. Even even without any uh, complicated reasons like somebody being hit by a bus or something like that, the project can just stop get stalled and just become obscure, obscure. Unfortunately, the the power of the product doesn't seem to uh, to mean that somebody will pick it up. And picking up projects that were abandoned uh, is generally very rare. It almost never happens. I think it's They're, very difficult to read through someone else's code when you can't even find them and, and ask them what it does and make any sense yeah. of it. And also, it's not their project. That's the big thing. On Linux, you know, as a playground for developers, why would you want to work on someone else's project? Isn't it more fun to create your own? It's not actually true for larger projects. For example, if there's right now GIMP, I don't think that anyone in the community will really want to try to create an alternative to GIMP. Uh, and I think that is generally frowned, uh, frowned by, down by the community. It's like frowned upon, sorry, sorry frowned upon by the community that if you're trying to do kind of the same thing that already exists, you're undermining the work of many people, the community, and so you shouldn't do that. I kind of and you're wasting your effort. Like you could do exactly. something useful, you're develop a good way. plugin, or fix a problem in that project, and everybody would benefit yes. from this. But there's an interesting side effect, by the way, uh, of this. So, side effect number one is that a lot of the better products, like you have a lot of open source products or free software products, they're popping up and then one of them becomes successful. You can never know which one, but let one of them become successful. Like Synapse FX or hmm? Ardor or Blender? Yeah, like Ardor, Blender. I mean, Blender is not the correct cho uh, correct example because Blender... It was proprietary and was bought out of being proprietary. Yeah open source from the start. So GIMP is a better example. But anyway, so you have all these projects pop up, then one of them becomes successful and it creates a snowball effect where users and developers get drawn to that project, they abandon all other things and they want to work on that one. And then, and so effectively, uh, many successful products on Linux are monopolies. So there's just GIMP. There's almost, uh, there are other editors which do slightly different things. But as a raster, image editor that is basically the best thing you have and there's no other editor that can match the initial feature set there uh, and it's very unlikely not impossible but super unlikely that people will even go there and start developing right because all the power is there 
Now, yeah. so that's effect number one is that you, they turn into monopolies. Effect number two is that they tend to be very different design wise from what you see in the proprietary world. And the reason for this is because you have this older product. Instead of developing something new, people just add new functions and change the product. And so you see a lot of evolution design. And this is something that Linus Torvalds said about the Linux kernel, that well, Linux kernel is not intelligent design. It's evolution. Uh, the, 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 the result, the end result, is that a lot of the stuff you see on Linux looks kind of outdated. Yeah, it can actually sometimes even do some of the modern things, but the design itself looks somewhere from the 90s. And the reason for this is because many free software developers who started that back in the 90s, they started that looking at the programs in the 90s or beginning of 2000s, and then they continued to develop that, community took, a, took it on, and so now 15 years later, the software is still around and they're working on it, uh, but it still looks kind of 90s. For example, if you look at Cube yeah. Tractor, uh, and this is the sequencer of my choice, I actually really like Cube Tractor partially because of the way how, of like how geeky and old school it looks. But <laughs> it actually is kind of me off, actually. From paper. And I like I talked to Rui and he says, yeah, like one of the one of the inspirations was Cakewalk. Now, I'm not saying that this is necessarily a problem, but this is just an interesting side effect. Uh, if you look at Q Tractor, it is a modern program that is basically using the concept of cakewalk. You and know, cakewalk is uh, that's an interesting thing because uh, if I can interrupt you up for a bit, because uh, like this yeah, is yeah. a problem that I have with uh, some commercial projects as well. Like I had to use Coral Draw in in one work where it was a industry standard, and now where I work, everybody uses this. I use Inkscape and I fix problems with Coral files with Inkscape, which is fun. But I I always got this feeling that Coral Draw is like a program designed 12 years ago or 20, and they still didn't redesign it because everybody that uses it is so used to it that they they would lose their user base if they redesign it and make made it modern. And the same applies to Pro Tools. Pro Tools was the first actual DAW that could record. With, with a computer. It, it had to have a separate piece of hardware because computers were unable to do this. But it was the first one. And and still, I, like, it's funny because it feels very perplexed and uneasy to use. Uh, and I prefer Ardor much more because it's much more modern, even though Paul Davis designed Ardor looking at Protos, and he asked people from Protos, like, would you give me the source code? They said, no, <laughs> why would we? And, and he started Ardor, but, uh, but Ardor actually is much more modern to my feeling. Like, it, it, I prefer Ardor. If I had to pay the same amount of money for Protos or Ardor, I would pick Ardor. I, I, th I, I think that you're correct in that there are, there are proprietary products that are also kind of outdated and for some for one reason or another they will not change their design but i think that the tendency the proprietary world is much is much less there uh if you look at photoshop if you look at many music programs you know like ableton fl studio uh did like an overhaul of their ui many yeah, times they changed stuff. a lot on this program exactly so like i think that proprietary tools generally at least have the capability of doing that from time to time, whereas if they on the open source world, it's much more difficult. Like you have to rewrite things completely with different paradigms. And com uh, commercial programs sometimes do that. They can say, "Well, we have this new version. We've completely rewritten everything, and they put it out." Uh, and this is less easy to do and less likely in the free software world. So the the though here's so somebody can you know listen to that and say, "So what are you saying here?" I'm not saying that this is bad. This is what it is. If you, if everybody using that understands what it is, then you know you're fine. You have correct expectations. You go into that world expecting that. Well, this is how it works. These are the peculiarities of, uh, uh, of you know, of uh, communal development. And yeah. I found that this is what I get from it. The problem, and this is what we started with, is only when people start to try. Uh, when they kind of start claiming that, oh yeah, and this communal development is better or as good as commercial development, where by good they define features, uh, you know, 
uh, getting the result and stuff like that. Uh, if, if we're talking about, I don't know, learning or something like that, or, or having fun developing, uh, if we talk about this kind of good, then maybe open source world actually wins because it's more fun. But if we're talking about getting results, then I think that open source world generally, or at least in many things like media, video, music, uh, that it loses in general today. And I think that part of that is also because a lot of the modern, uh, a lot of the modern tools, and specifically in the realms of audio and video, are very complex. And it's much more difficult for an open source team uh, to do that. Not impossible. This is being done. There are products that are highlights, but in general, it's rare. And if you have uh, like Inkscape, that's it. We have GIMP, that's the only program. Nobody else is going to do that. And then we have Godot now, this game engine, which is becoming more prominent. I oh, yeah. You see that they're working. At, although Godot is also, they started as a proprietary product. Yeah, Godot is sure. bind to Occam Studio that, that makes games and they made it for themselves, but they open sourced it. Yeah. Yeah, which is so great it's the same. It's, because there is a, a team. Story. This is a good way for... Um, so one of the things that I... Um, when I analyze proprietary software versus free software and whether free software freedoms are actually essential to everybody, and this is something that really humanity has to adapt, uh, one of the things... And I generally, like, my answer, again, like, uh, it's difficult to give the arguments right now. I'm going to release the article soon. I hope by the end of summer and then everybody can read it. It's super academic in a way, like it's written very carefully so that all the arguments are presented, but in general, they'll be there. And I, I mostly think that most of these freedoms are actually irrelevant, but there are cases where, um, where you would want to not waste human effort. One of them is uh, when you have a commercial program, which is really good, which is high quality, and then for some reason, they decide to discontinue running it as a business. I think it, it is at that point generally that would be nice to release it to everyone. Now, uh, I don't think I'm not yeah. sure whether this should be like a prescriptive moral thing. I'm I'm not sure, you know, like that, whether people should do that or must do that. But I think that in general, sometimes that is a very good idea, and I'm very thankful to those those companies and people who decided to do that with Blender or uh, with whatever tool there is, like with Godot. This is great. And also, they don't have to run out of business, right? Sometimes they actually do crowdsourcing, and they can they can achieve their goals. It's not as lucrative, maybe, but they can do it sometimes. By the way, uh, so yeah, <clears throat> this is the part where I really think uh, that would be cool if you know an older tool that is no longer available is kind of released for free for everyone, open source, and just okay, just do whatever. Yeah, I think like. Um the big problem with comparing commercially developed software with communally devel developed software, the open source community, is that companies are making, this is a business, people are making are making living from developing this thing, these things, because money is involved and we need money to, to live, right? So open source projects are always needing much more development power, much more time and much more energy and these things are limited as you said someone gets married someone gets someone has children and and the project is not developed anymore but i think that like for the last couple of years maybe a decade rather it's like we're slowly developing something that might change this i think because like now we have patreon and many people are starting to to make businesses out of their creative work. And for example, there is a guy who created animation nodes add-on for Blender. And he has a Patreon and like, you know, he gets a couple hundred dollars a month. No, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe it's too much. But open source product, projects should be developed by people who get paid for their work <laughs> because this software is free, but yeah. it's not free to make. And if we want good software, we should get ready to support the developers financially. And this is what I tell to people. Like, you like open source software, you want to use it, you want it to grow, share your money. <laughs> because when with commercial software, you buy something and then you get to use it. And both sides benefit. When you use open source software, the developers don't benefit apart from seeing that someone downloaded it. So we need to give back. And I think that 
there it needs to be a shift in the community that we need to start supporting developers with our money. Maybe Patreon is is a tool to do this. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think crowdsourcing, I mean, it, it already plays a pretty significant uh, role in uh, society. Not, you know, still very low, but the things are being done right now. Um, it's interesting and not yet clear how this will play out in the future, whether it's possible to support everything by crowdsourcing. I currently doubt it. I think that it will always be a small niche. It might be much larger in terms of percentages, and it'll see, like, in absolute numbers, it will be very large. But in relative numbers, it's still going to be smaller. And there, uh, I think that uh, it would be interesting to look at the comparison of how much people can actually make using, for example, if we're talking only about software, how much you can actually make using proprietary model and using open source crowdsource model. Um, it's, you know, you can actually use crowdsource with proprietary programs as well. Nothing stops you from that because Patreon and similar crowdsourcing uh, things uh, they don't force you to actually you know open the code open the code yeah. but at the same time this is not a panacea and one of the examples that uh, <laughs> that probably you've heard and uh, people who watch my bad geek videos know I watch all of them they're great yeah which was which and I, I'm a, I'm a big critic of open shot specifically because the web because it's so bad it's so unreliable in terms of just not stable software and at the same time nothing just nothing on their website points to that the website lists a whole uh kind of set of features and it looks really nice and you're asking yourself wait a minute how can that not be the ultimate video editor for linux and it just doesn't work it's just even the newer version and so the important thing the reason i bring up OpenShot in relation to crowdsourcing is because the developer of OpenShot made a Kickstarter project where he said, I'll develop, so I'm using this MLT or MILT, or I forget what's the yeah, name. Yeah, MLT, MELT the framework. MLT library, yeah. MLT library, uh, and it's super unstable. So his claim was that my software is great. It is the library that is unstable, and there's a screenshot actually I have from their forum. I mean, it's probably still there, but just in case it gets deleted or something like that, where they say, our software is super stable. It's the library, which is a problem. And so he says, I'm going to go out and write a library, lib open shot. I'm going to do that, you know, and people pledge money. And then he eventually did that. It took him a very long time, very long time, much longer than he promised. And then he came out, here's the library, or maybe he, he put out the library in time just so that I'm not, you know, I'm not... Uh, uh, distributing falsehoods here, uh, but uh, th then he said, I'm going to develop my own video editor around this library, and this time, all these MLT problems are going to be gone, it's going to be stable, and stuff like that. So, maybe he live in time. And then, I took, uh, a, you know, I tried his open shot too, and it's just, it, it's been months, if not more than a year, I guess, since he released it. It's as bad as ever. It's just, it just crashes all the time, freezes. It's impossible to work with. And this guy had a Kickstarter campaign. This guy was paid to do that full time. He was actually run, uh, writing the program full time. It did not help. We have no video editor. Open shot to is unusable as of today, at least on my computer and I, on the computer of my friend. He tried it, I tried it, it just doesn't work. It, it, and this guy was paid. So apparently it's also about maybe the skill of the developer and or the amount of people working simultaneously on the product. Or maybe it's not only the developer, but it also there have to be testers. And this is another very big feature slash bug of the open source community that yeah. is good or bad, depending on how you approach things, is that all the testing is typically outsourced to the user. Yeah, And that means that reliability of software, in a way, is not felt to be developer's responsibility. Hey, guys, I wrote the code. Now you please test it because I have no resources for it. I don't care. All I will do is claim that this software can do this, 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 this. Oh, the fact that it crashes every two seconds? Oh, that's not my you know, problem. File bugs. And so you get in a situation where a lot of the software looks like very lucrative tools. And you think, wow, I'm going to use that. And then you install it, and it just unusable, just crashes, crashes, crashes. And uh, yeah, so that's that, that's one of the things that 
development in itself. Like the good thing about Patreon and Kickstarter is that they give possible platforms for development, but they don't actually solve the problem of good, well-educated structure, you know, of the team. Uh, well, well, when a person not just is a developer, but he has testers, he has a product manager or something like that, where a person understands UX designer maybe, and which is important when you're using tools, right? You have to understand, you have to make sure the tool is more efficient. And when you looked into the amount of work that is put into proprietary products, like a lot of people sometimes feel, hey, so you're, you know, you did Photoshop or whatever, now you're charging money and you're not showing the code. Why can't you just do that? I, th I think that very frequently they don't understand how much work actually goes into this and that this is the result of hundreds of people working on that product. For years. Which has had millions and millions of Daily. Of code as well. Yeah. Yeah. And then... And when you're looking at an open source project, it will typically suffer from lack of documentation, bad UX design, bad product design, where it's not clear who the product is even for, and you know the features are weirdly uh, developed and stuff like that. I actually have a talk on that from uh, LAC LAC 2016 in Berlin, where I kind of cover some of these topics. But uh, yeah, and so and so in the end, one developer on Patreon is not enough, right? For example, you uh, said um, uh, you kind of linked me to Natron, uh, this software that is a, a compositor software for yeah. video. And they, yeah, and now they have a proper team. So these guys have like a whole team of people working on that. And you can see that they're yeah, probably... They, and, were, like, and they got funded like, I, I don't know, a year of development of the whole team. Somehow, like, they, they got funds to make an open source program and they carried on yeah. the development after the funding ended. So it's like slowed down, but they've got the base and, and, and they're developing it. Yeah, yeah. But and they, they didn't like... have like a proper team where you have not just one developer or two developers working on it, they have like a whole team. That's, I think, that's a, a more viable approach. But then it's much more difficult to execute. And if you look at commercial companies all around the world, most of them will fail. Uh, or they will find maybe a very niche use case, like you develop a program and then several people use it, and this guy developed a program and several people use it, and then somebody finally develops something that eventually everybody uses, right? So there's also competition there. I think that sometimes people assume that, oh, well, it's open source, therefore it's just gonna work. No, you can develop huge amounts of open source products and they're gonna be shit, and nobody's gonna be using them at all. And then finally, maybe one day, there will be one team that is both well-funded knows what they're doing and actually create a product that work that works and these three factors are not easy to come by for anyone the same team can come together try another product and it won't work because these are difficult things so i think that open source in the end is one factor and it's an important factor and i'm actually for open source i like open source i just realized that it, it is a specific tool that is not a panacea so I've talked too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't see me. You don't know what you people watching this, but, but Luigi can't see me because I have like we rooted the, the webcam. So so I'm just recording on video, but Luigi can't see me. So the only way to interrupt him is to do is for me to do. Yes, <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I would grant to Linux Audio the fact that it does challenge you. Um, like there are. And like for me, oh, yeah. uh, it is fun <laughs> to take you know like the basic tools that Linux offers, and sometimes these outdated synthesizers that have these weird '80s, beginning of the '90s sounds, and you do something with them, and you come up with an interesting result. I kind of I like that. I, I love experimenting on Linux. I just realized that, for example, for certain genres, like uh, if I want to make techno or house, it's super difficult to use the modular environment. It's okay to use LMS actually. Uh, but um, anyway, I, I would actually gladly talk about LMS at a, maybe at a later date, not today. Uh, but uh, LMS is a, is a great example. It's a good software. I just wish that it was developed more. The fact that it doesn't support also LV2 plugins is a problem. Yeah, that, that is a big, big lack because yes, and most of the good LV2 uh, plugins it happens in are LV2. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the original de developer of, of LMS, Paul... Giblock, I believe. Yeah. Uh, 
he was planning to, so he stopped working on LMMS uh, just by the, so I came to Linux in 2009. And that's about the time that he said, oh, I'm actually embarking on a large project. I'm going to rebuild the whole LMMS from scratch. And it's going to be a very different thing. It's going to be modular. It's going to be this, it's going to be that. And it never happened. And I think- Yeah, I think he started that, making uh, something called Unison Studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember yeah, exactly. this. Yeah, and it but never happened. Never, like, like, actually, I actually talked to him on, on Google Talk. And, uh, I kind of wrote him, hey, Paul, what's going on? Maybe a couple of years later. He's like, oh, I don't know. Like, I think he didn't do anything. He had some things going on in his life. And I don't, I don't think that Unison is ever happening. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, if LMS was continued to be developed, it would have been pretty cool because in terms of what it can do as, a, as a, an all-in-one DAW, it's pretty impressive. It has... Advanced automation, it has this, it has that, it has, you know, peak controller, which are really LFO controllers, cool. you can link stuff, you can link yeah, controls so to your MIDI yeah. controller on your desk and twist knobs live or something, or record this automation with your knobs or faders. Yeah, it's like it's like a proper DAW. It's, it's, I think it's about the level of FL Studio 4, what, back in the time when it was... The first one I used was FL Studio 5. <laughs> I, I learned yeah. on it. I was on FL Studio 3.4, I think. Uh, it actually, so it was already a very able sequencer. Uh, I think that sometimes nowadays people still call it Fruity Loops. And when it just started, I think version one or two, it was just a beats grid. It didn't even have a piano roll. Uh, by version three that I already had, it had a proper piano roll. It was, you could do anything you want with it at that point in time. But somehow people still believe that it's this kind of weird. But it's one of the most popular sequencers nowadays, actually. Uh, there are statistics, and FL Studio seems to be one of the most popular and used sequencers currently, even above Ableton, as far as I understand. Uh, it doesn't mean maybe among not among professionals, but just in terms of sheer numbers, I saw somewhere a poll that, that said, yep, this is like the most used right now, according to some stats. You know, uh, viewers can verify that information. I don't think that it's terribly important, but all it says is just that it's, you know, it's um, pretty much on par with a lot of these sequencers. And so the fact that LMMS is basically like the early but already super capable version of uh, Fruity Loops is a very big compliment in my view. I think by version five, they already were called FL Studio. And, uh, you know, uh, so LMS is a big thing. And when I started, I thought that's what I'm gonna do. But there are many problems that make it very difficult. There are no presets for, uh, for effects. Uh, the effects are not synced to the host yeah. as far as I know. Uh, you have to, like if you're using a delay, you have to set it up all the time. At least that's because because it is uh, it is LASPA, and uh, so LASPA there's no B BPM syncing to 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 DAW that LV2 has. Yeah, and they have like milliseconds. This is something that I wrote in my Linux uh, audio overview. Like I, I'm, you know, but anyway, I, I I think that that should be a separate topic. LMS is a, is a great thing, but uh, I'm just not sure that it's ever going to be uh, developed again. Uh, any seriously, it's just very unlikely. Not impossible, but very unlikely. And this is a bummer because theoretically, it's a very good, it's a very good piece of open source software that is actually capable. You can actually get results with it. I made uh, like I don't know three or four full length albums of electronic dance music. Yeah. It. Yeah. And there you go. And the and fifth when I, when is I, coming out later this year. I'm just finishing my my mixes and, and recording some vocals and stuff in Ardor. There is another pretty cool open source tool, and that is Mix. Oh yeah, the DJ. Thing. And uh, this is this was actually a big surprise for me because for a long time Mix was very basic, kind of this two-channel DJ uh, platform. It was stable actually. It was stable and used by well, some DJs. Well, that's that's a of... mandatory thing for DJing software. It's not stable. Yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's crap. Yeah. So so they're pretty stable. And uh, then they came out with Mix Two, which oh, you know offers speed grids and loops and everything and four decks. Uh, there are weird design decisions there. For example, you cannot get four decks unless you choose a, a particular skin and the skin will that. dictate. Yeah, and then I had to actually change the skin because they had very weird knob mapping. Yeah, you but modified anyway, you the have... skin for your needs, right? Yeah, you can just, it, it's just an XML file. You can just exchange things. So I just put them around in different order because they have a very different order. But anyway, so I, I, and I started using that a little bit. I actually bought two controllers already for that. 
I just because I, I decided that I'm not going to go into DJing until I complete my article on free software. <laughs> so as soon as I complete my article on Stallman's philosophy, I'm going to go into DJing. And also in parallel, I'm actually right now learning to write minimal techno and minimal house rhythms because this is, you know, this is a science in of itself. It's uh, pretty complicated to do. Um, you don't get the result that easily, but you know, I'm getting there. So I've heard some of your tracks from Berlin Songbook. Was it called on SoundCloud? Yeah, you released some it. some minimal yeah, techno it. tracks. So you actually inspired me to make like, one minimal techno track myself, but I haven't played it to anybody yet. <laughs> Maybe yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll drop uh, a link. Songbook, it's like I think it's volume two. So volume zero was from my very early days before even Linux volume one was when I took some of that and redone that, and I have a couple of mixes there. And now the volume two is when I'm learning this more properly maybe or, or in a more dedicated manner but i'm still not entirely happy with the results because you have to learn a lot about how the sound works with kind of you know how to construct a beat how to make it sound properly and all of that kind of stuff uh although of course when you're mixing it in uh in dj software typically it the audio engine will make it sound prettier also because you're mixing stuff and maybe the frequencies somehow work together well but typically when i use even my tracks that I don't consider to be that good at all in terms of sound, they sound pretty de decent in DJ software, be it tracked or, or even mixed, so. I'm looking forward to hear your minimal techno set on Sonoy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I hope yeah, to drop yeah. my uh, various EDM genres mix from my upcoming album there, too. Probably there you go. I'm going to suck at DJing because I'm not a DJ, but I'm going to give it a try. Maybe some live vocals will go, I yeah, don't know. I mean, it depends. Like, in my case, I'm doing, uh, so I'm not doing normal DJing. I'm doing what is typically called the controllerism, but it's also not exactly that. So uh, it's more I'm like a live of, act, actually. You're triggering yeah, sync, you know, sequence, you sequencers and stuff. Playing, and then you just create a new track out of all of them. I typically use very short loops, like two bar, four bar loops. And then I compose them and, I, and then you hear something that is actually not in the original tracks it's like a weird combination of them and you can you can do a lot by just even using the equalizer and the filters and stuff like that so it's actually a lot of fun to do so you're but doing you this with mix have... yeah you're doing this with mix yeah yeah so that's why you yeah. why you like the four tracks so much because you can like have yes. stems like drums bass leads pads or stuff Kind of. I mean, it's not, it's not entirely that. You can do that as well, but just you need more source material, more than two tracks. Uh, because then you can use, for example, two tracks are playing an interesting combination. They can have all the bass and drums at the same time. Depends. You can try different things. On one, you can remove, for example, the low frequencies. Yeah. On the other, gonna be low. so you can kind of connect. And then with these two tracks, you can start phasing in something new, and it always moves. It's always in the process of moving somewhere. Uh, there's not a... I rarely have, like all four decks are playing because then you can do nothing. So it's going to be two or three playing and then I always face something in, face something out. Uh, so it's a lot of fun and I'm very happy that I can do this on Mix because right now the cost of moving from Linux to Windows for me would be pretty high. Uh, I, there are generally a lot of things I really like on my Linux system. Uh, there are many things I don't like, uh, but you know, Wi-Fi in particular is very complicated. But but in general, I'm happy, and so, of course, I don't really want to move. I would prefer to be on Linux, and so I'm happy that Fox Studio works. And so I just like Linux operating system in general more than I like currently Windows. Mac OS, I tried, but I never really got into it. And I did because I didn't have to. I decided not to, but, you know, so I... I've been using Mac OS uh, when I worked for a, for a video films, a little film studio for, like, three months. But then I, I was finally sure that the guy that hired me is, is a fraud and he owes me money. Uh, but I used a, a Hackintosh machine. No, it was a genuine wow. Mac Pro or something. And, and we ran Cubase and then Reaper there. And, and he had uh, the full contact and, and Massive and FM8 and Absinthe, all the native instruments. Uh, pack and and I got to use that finally, and it was funny. I, I mixed this with Tal Noisemaker and Helm because Zenat Sub FX wasn't available in on Mac as a plugin then. Uh, it finally is. I guess Zen Fusion is available, or maybe not yet. I don't know. 
and it's it's an interesting experience and it also show me that op proprietary software has its problems as well it's not like it just works sometimes it just works and open source software also just works sometimes <laughs> but it's not like uh, it, it's an eldorado you you don't fix your no. all your problems just by buying something proprietary you fix some problems for sure but it's i don't know by the way uh, we are like over 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 one hour so maybe we should wrap it up yeah, yeah. and i yeah, think i have yeah. a i think i have a nice thought that could wrap it up on my side and then you could wrap it up on your side and we will say goodbye to our audience okay. so the the whole thing like uh, when I started making music, I started making music because a friend, uh, my good friend, sent me a copy of FL Studio 5 and I just started making beats because there was these four samples, kick, snare, hi-hat and clap. And you could pick some numbers and hit play and it was played in a loop and it was, I was just mesmerized with this. And years later, I decided I, I'd like to be legal and not use cracked software, so I searched and I found a tracker. Uh, I made one album with it, and I found the LMMS. And I always, I always decided to take the harder route to get where I want to go. Because like most people uh, download cracked software, download samples from other people, download presets, and they just throw them together and make something. But I wanted to make my music as much my own as possible. So I started synthesizing drums from scratch because I heard pens like Pendulum and, and I don't know, nowadays Skrillex. And, and like you hear that these sounds are made. <laughs> Someone makes them. They have to be possible. So I started experimenting and I finally, after years, figured out how to make some decent synthesized drums. And it's like, I'm always taking the harder route. I could, I could just, you know, crack some FL Studio and, and use cracked windows or something when I didn't have the money, or now when I have the money, I could buy it. But I feel like I'm developing a lot just by forcing myself to overcome these limitations and learn how to do nice things with simple tools. And yeah, it's difficult. But when I get the good tools, I can do stuff that is decent, but it's not like super great. I don't know, it's not like I'm instantly doing better stuff than I'm doing without these tools. So it's also interesting, but, but I don't have a problem switching. I just uh, like to I, challenge you reminded, myself. You reminded me of an old joke. Uh, there's this joke, so I'm reading. Uh, I thought using loops was cheating, so I programmed my own using samples. I know it. <laughs> I don't thought using samples was cheating, so I recorded real drums. I don't thought that programming it was cheating, so I learned to play drums for real. I then thought using bought drums was cheating, so I learned to make my own. I then thought using pre-made skins was cheating, so I killed the goat and skinned it. I don't, then thought that was cheating too, so I grew my own goat from a baby goat. I also think that it's cheating, but I'm not sure where to go from here. I haven't made my, any music lately with the goat farming and all. <laughs> yeah, I know that. Oh. Yeah, I don't want to go that far. I'm not writing my own synthesizers. <laughs> and I'm not writing my own DOS. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, for, for, me, uh, for me, Linux, uh, Linux Audio was uh, an interesting playground for ambient music because it's modular, and uh, in ambient music, you sometimes want to get away from the grid and so uh, i'm using linux very frequently for uh for audio experiments and for building an ambient uh, composition because it's just easier to do ambient uh and uh, you know i kind of love the charm of this kind of old school feel that a lot of linux stuff has um and there are some unique tools that i like to use that nobody else has typically so that kind of uniqueness is pretty cool uh, uh so yeah that's kind of that's that's you know uh, that what what keeps me. I also like the community. Uh, I actually also um, sometimes go to demo parties, which is a demo scene community, which has nothing to do with open source at all, right? But yeah. like I like a lot of these communities. It's fun when there's an activity and then the community forms around it, and open source is just one of them. And you know, I enjoy uh, just enjoy being in that world and looking at some software. It's also fun to bash it as well, um, <laughs> and because it really doesn't kind of belong to anyone. Uh, you can do that without being afraid that you're gonna really, uh, you know, offend someone because well, there are many people who work on it. You can always say, well, it wasn't me; it was this guy who added this code. So, uh, but yeah, but uh, I always keep a cool head in terms of like I started off being a big fan of open source and thinking that everybody should adopt it and free software philosophy, and then gradually as I 
think matured as a person and as a developer and then as a product manager who has worked in the software industry, I began to, my views began to shift away from that kind of radical free softwareism. And then today, I think I'm, I'm moderate, very moderate uh, in terms of I think that free and open source is useful, but I don't think that it's uh, something that is morally superior in general terms. Uh, it's just a great way to, one of the great ways to do software and just uh, frequently fun community that forms around this process. I think that's a good thought to wrap up our video. Yep. Thanks for hanging out. Thank you. And yeah, we probably should do maybe with uh, Nils Hilbricht another Sonoy video because we're getting closer. Let's bounce some ideas definitely. maybe. Check, yeah. check how many people are registered already, how the organization is, is going. Okay, okay, sir. I have to also signing off. Thanks, and uh, let's do this again someday. Yeah, thanks. Let's switch to off the record. See you okay, next time.